Are you able to pick a lock? If yes, good for you. That's a good skill for a security person to have. Not everyone can. In fact, most real-world petty criminals and burglars are not capable of picking locks, but they still manage to break in with much lower skill attacks. Are you able to open locks the way they do? And finally, to bridge the gap between the cyber world and the physical world, can you do privilege escalation on a mechanical lock? In other words, can you, as an insider, exploit possession of the key to your own office to manufacture a master key that will open all the other offices in the building? Welcome to Frank Stajano Explains. I'm professor of security and privacy at the Department for Computer Science and Technology of the University of Cambridge, and this is the final video in my undergraduate course in security. All the other lectures in the course are available from the playlist in the card above. Our final topic is physical security and in particular mechanical locks with a whirlwind tour of lock picking, raking, bumping and related attacks, including Matt Blaze's ingenious privilege escalation attack on master lock systems. And that's because a well-rounded computer security professional should also have at least some basic competence on physical security. There is a natural affinity between the topics of cybersecurity and physical security. As I said in the introduction to this course, nobody can design a secure lock without being skilled at lock picking. And this has an obvious direct parallel in the computer security world. Attack and defense are one. Quite a few people with a serious interest in computer security also enjoy picking locks as a hobby, because it's the same mindset. In any case, security is holistic. As we said on several occasions, we need to consider the whole system and we need to use the broadest possible meaning of the word system. In particular, physical security of the hardware cannot be underestimated. An attacker with physical control over your computer is generally in a position to do almost anything to it, including taking out the hard disk and imaging it, installing an invisible hardware keylogger that will henceforth exfiltrate all of your keystrokes wirelessly, installing a hardware trojan, or simply stealing the machine altogether, not to mention denial of service attacks involving sledgehammers. And we're not even talking about what state sponsored assassins might do, such as you know, smearing polonium 210 or Novichok on the keyboard. But if you're in the, in the crosshairs of this type of people, then you should have more serious concerns than merely computer security. So let's not go there. So it then does make sense to evaluate the physical security of the premises as part of a general security assessment. And towards that, some competence is required in, among other things, being able to discriminate between the locks that can be easily bypassed and those that put up a bit more of a fight. People who are unfamiliar with lock picking are often surprised when they discover how easy it is to open what they thought was a reasonable lock. Very few locks cannot be opened by a skilled lock picker equipped with good tools. But one does not need to be an exceptional lock picker to be able to get through rather more locks than you might think. Many products on the market are as carelessly produced security-wise as their software counterparts, and some of the most effective lock bypass techniques do not require great skill at all. I certainly won't claim to be a 10th Dan lock picker, but at least I know my way around and if you're a university student in your 20s now, then I was manufacturing my own lockpicks by filing street sweeper bristles since before you were born. So let me show you a few basic things. The usual disclaimer applies here too. Stay legal. Do not pick locks you don't own, even if they are on the door of your room, unless the owner of the lock has given you written permission to do so. Also, do not pick locks that are in use, even if you actually own them, because there is always a non-zero chance that you might mess things up and then the lock might stop working, which would leave you with either a locked front door that you can't open or with an open front door that you can't lock, both of which are rather undesirable situations. So by all means, experiment and learn, but do so on locks that you procured just for that purpose. Now, with that said, let's begin. The most common lock design, and the only one we'll deal with in this very brief overview, is the so-called pin tumbler lock. There's a small metal cylinder called the plug, which must rotate for the lock to open. I, I've broken this and I've taken it apart so that I can show you. So if I take this out, the key is inserted in this plug, which is a cylinder like this, and this cylinder has to rotate inside the lock to move a part that I've now removed. 
sorry, here's another lock that I haven't broken yet. Um, as the key turns, then this part is moved and it pushes the latch uh, into or out of the door. The key point is making the plug turn. So this plug, this cylinder, contains some chambers, some holes that you may or may not see on the camera. We will see when I get to edit this video. So these holes are designed to contain pins, pin tumbler lock. This is the plug with its chambers and this is the key. And I'm going to put some pins in some of the chambers at random, like this a pin and another pin. There we go. If I look at the plug here, then the pins have fallen in. If I stick the key in, then the indentations in the key will make these pins bob up and down. And in this position, for example, one of the pins is down into the plug and another one of the pins pushes up out of the plug. Now, in the housing of the cylinder over here, uh, what is known as the Bible, this side here, contains uh, holes matching the holes in the plug. And in these holes are the pin stacks. So this plug would normally be upside down like this, with the pins facing down inside this, um, inside this block. I'm going to do this because they, they're going to fall out otherwise. But in each of these chambers, we're going to find a spring, then a driver pin, and then the key pin that I have just put in the plug. So the spring pushes the driver pin against the key pin. So this is the arrangement. You have the key pin inside the plug, then on top of the key pin, on each stack you have a driver pin, like this, and on top of that you have a spring, and all of that is actually upside down uh, within here. Like this. In a case like this one, where the key pin sticks out of the plug, then the plug is prevented from turning by the fact that this key pin is now uh, inside the hole in the Bible. In a case like the adjacent one, where the key pin is down inside the plug, it's going to be the driver pin that is pushed by the spring against the key pin, and therefore it's penetrated inside the plug, and it's going to be the driver pin that stops the plug from rotating. So this means that the plug can only rotate inside the housing when the key pin is just flush with the surface of the cylinder, and so is the driver pin that pushes against it. And this has to happen for each of the pin stacks. All of the pin stacks have to be aligned at the shear line for the plug to be able to turn. It wouldn't be able to turn in this case. In theory, even though individual key pins can be manipulated by inserting a suitable tool called a lockpick in the keyway, it should not be possible to check whether a certain pin height is correct for a given pin stack by attempting to turn the plug without having discovered the correct height for all the other pin stacks, because the plug would only turn when all the pin stacks are in the right place. Now, if this theory were true, this would force the lockpicker to explore all combinations, the number of which grows exponentially with the number of pin stacks. If S is the number of pin stacks and C is the number of different cut heights that the key might have in each position, then the number of different keys in the system is C raised to the power S. And the theory is that, in attempting to brute force the lock, each of these combinations would have to be tried independently, either by cutting a new key for each combination or by somehow lifting each of the pins to the designated height simultaneously. And therefore, C to the S would quantify the effort of picking the lock. Unfortunately for the defenders, though, the practice is rather different from this theory. Due to mechanical torrences in the construction of the lock, if 
torque is applied to the plug without using the correct key, without any key inside the keyway, and the plug is therefore prevented from turning by the driver pins that are partly in the housing and partly in the plug, then it is not the case that all S of the pins will be binding at once. Instead, one of them will bind slightly before the others, and the others will be comparatively loose. This effect is more pronounced in cheaper locks because of the poor mechanical manufacturing tolerances. Given that, the technique of single pin picking consists essentially of applying torque with the tension tool and attempting to push each pin stack gently against its spring with the lock pick, which is called lifting, until one stack is identified as resisting more than the others. And that will be the one that is binding. And if the pin stack in which the driver pin is binding is lifted, well, lifted up in the case of North American lock or pushed down in the case of European lock, while simultaneously continuing to apply torque to the plug using some uh, tensioning tool, like, like this, uh, then when that driver pin reaches the shear line, it will exit the plug and at that point there will be a click because the mechanical constraint that was stopping the plug from rotating is lifted and the plug rotates by a minute amount until it stops against the next driver pin that is binding. And then uh, the previous driver pin is considered set in, and it's now completely outside the plug and is prevented from being pushed back into the plug by the fact that the microscopic rotation has now partially obstructed its return path. So the lock picker then repeats the process with the remaining pin stacks that are not yet set to identify which one is the next driver pin that is binding. And this goes on until the last pin stack is lifted, at which point the plug will turn freely under the applied torque and the lock will open. So here's the kind of regular padlock you might find in any hardware store, like this. Hardened, okay, hardened. What we do is we insert a tensioning tool into the keyway, like this. If we try to apply torque to the plug, it will not turn because the driver pins are pushed into the plug by their springs. But we keep applying this tension as we insert the lock pick into the keyway and we probe to find which of the pin stacks is binding and we push it down. And uh, once we have done that with all the pin stacks, we get in a situation where we can turn the plug and open the lock. There we go. That wasn't that hard. In terms of the complexity of the attack, the lock picker must first probe all S pin stacks to find the one that is binding, then lift or push that one until it sets, potentially trying all the cut heights, C, and then probe the remaining S minus one pin stacks and lifting the next binding one, and then the remaining S minus two pin stacks and so forth. And this process is dominated by the number of probes, which is the S -th triangular number. In other words, the complexity of lock picking using this single pin picking technique is only quadratic in S, the number of stacks, rather than exponential in S, which would be uh, the theoretical number of different keys. And when a competent lock picker is doing it, it doesn't take very much time at all. In actual practice, however, unless the pin tumbler lock is manufactured to very strict tolerances, which this one definitely isn't, uh, and or contains special anti-picking security pins, which this one doesn't, then it would be susceptible to lock picking attacks that require less skill and are much faster than single pin picking. Now, uh, this is the same lock as before. Let's lock it again. This is the same tensioning tool as before. Let's insert it into the keyway again and apply torque. And uh, there we go. The raking attack consists of rapidly scrubbing all the pins back and forth with the jiggling motion of a wave-shaped lockpick while applying torque to the plug with the tension tool as before. This operation essentially tries all the cases of single pin picking at high speed without the lock picker even being aware of which pin is binding at any given time. And when it works, this technique opens the lock in almost instantly and it requires much less dexterity than single pin picking. If you become interested in lock sport, which is the recreational activity of opening locks, raking will give you immediate satisfaction against your first few padlocks and you'll pick up this skill in no time.
A single pin picking will require a little more practice, but it's OK. Nowadays, you can very easily get cheap pick sets from the likes of Amazon and eBay. And also, you can get yourself higher quality lock picks from specialized sellers. And you'll find a wealth of high quality lock picking videos online. My top three favorite YouTube channels on the subject are those of Lock Picking Lawyer, Bosnian Bill, who's now sadly retired, but all his videos are still up. And my friend Divyant Olaf, a physical penetration tester who's also written an outstanding book, Practical Lockpicking, which I highly recommend. But as I told you earlier, those of us who started before YouTube and online stores existed, when the only available resource was the mythical MIT Guide to Lockpicking by some pseudonymous Ted the Tool, we used to make our own lockpicks by filing the street bristles left behind by street sweeper garbage trucks. And these are some of the old lockpicks I made back in that time and the associated uh, tensioning tools. From the viewpoint of the security professional, though, you must understand that lockpicking is still, in a sense, just a game with its own boundaries and rules, and that to assess the physical security of a system, you must consider attackers don't play by the rules of the game, any game. So how do you open a lock without even picking it? Very few burglars actually engage in lockpicking, even at the relatively low skill level of raking. Something that burglars actually do is this. Here's a cylinder lock for a front door. Here's a key that would open this lock. Okay, turns the plug. Here's another key that doesn't fit this lock because it's actually been filed to the maximum depth in every possible cut. So it's a completely generic key. Doesn't fit the lock, doesn't turn the plug, but look what happens. There we go. Plug turns. That's the key that doesn't open this lock. But I just bumped the lock. Okay. And it works. So why does this work? A skeleton key like this is prepared by filing a key that goes into the keyway to the maximum depth in every possible position. Okay, and also I have filed the color of the key slightly so that the key goes in just a fraction of a millimeter more than the regular key because this color here has been filed as well. So I insert the skeleton key and push it in and what happens inside the lock is that because I filed the color then these edges will push against the bottom of the key pins for all the key stacks at the same time. Then when I bump the key like this while simultaneously applying torque to uh, the skeleton key, then the bump of my um, screwdriver against the key is transferred to uh, the key pins, the driver pins, uh, and the key pins are blocked in, in the plug by the fact that I'm pushing them with this skeleton key. But the kinetic energy is then transferred to the driver pins, which are pushed against their springs into the Bible. And since I am uh, timely applying torque to the key, then uh, the plug can turn. So it takes a small amount of practice to get the hang of it, but this attack, when it works, it opens the lock practically instantaneously. And the relatively few burglars that manipulate locks non-destructively tend to use bumping rather than lock picking. What most real-world burglars tend to do, however, is a rather more literal brute force attack called lock snapping. They grab the cylinder with heavy-duty pliers from the front and wiggle it sideways back and forth with great force until they snap it into in the middle, here, at its weakest point where there's the least amount of metal. Then they pull out the broken half of the cylinder and they, they retract the latch manually and they get in and they steal all your goods. This is clearly a destructive attack, obviously not meant for covert entry, but it is low skill and it lets them in in less than half a minute. What about countermeasures? Some locks will include security pins that instead of being cylindrical are spool shaped, mushroom shaped or serrated or otherwise weird. And these interfere with the basic pin lifting process and they easily get stuck at a shear line while you're applying torque with the tension tool. They will generally defeat raking and they will make single pin picking rather more difficult. A skilled lock picker will still get past them, but they will stop most of the amateurs.
springs of different strength in the various spin stacks are one countermeasure that tends to work against pumping. Regarding lock snapping, modern security cylinders have a kind of a sacrificial section at the front that will break off during a snapping attack but will leave the core of the lock still intact inside the door frame. And with that I want to move to privileged escalation in master lock systems. This fascinating piece of work is due to brilliant security researcher and cryptographer Matt Blaze, who used to be my colleague at the time when we both worked for AT&T Research. His paper caused quite a stir in the locksmith community when it came out in 2002. What's a master key system? A master key system is one where there are several locks with individual distinct keys for the doors of the, say, the offices of the employees of an organization, where each employee can only open their own office, but not those of their colleagues. And then there is one master key for the building manager that opens all the locks. And I'm actually simplifying here for sake of brevity, because it is possible to have rather more complex hierarchical arrangements of master keys, but let's, let's not worry about that. Let's instead understand the fundamentals of the blaze privilege, privilege escalation attack. So in the pin tumbler locks that we've been talking about, master keying is implemented by putting more than two pins in at least some of the pin stacks. If, the, if we indicate the possible cup depths with integers between 0 as the shallowest and 9 as the deepest cut, then a key in an S-pin lock is represented by an S-digit number, for example, 46217. Uh, there are five digits, so there would be five pin stacks. So this would be uh, designating an employee key that is normally indicated uh, as a differ key in a master key system. So in this example, uh, the second pin stack for 6217 has a key pin corresponding to the cut depth of 6. So a key pin cut to the depth of 6 in the second position would be flush with the surface of, of the plug. If we replace this uh, keeping of 6 with a combination of a keeping of height 4 and a master pin of height 2, then their combined height will still be 6, meaning that this 46217 key will still open the lock. But now the 44217 key, which could be our master key, now opens this lock as well. If we wanted our master key 44217 to open all other doors in the building, how should we pin those other doors? Well, theoretically speaking, we have almost complete freedom. There, there are, in fact, some mechanical constraints to account for manufacturing tolerances, but let's ignore that issue for now and pretend that all numbers are valid. So for each new lock, we pick a previously unused combination of depths, for example, 34738, and that will be our differ key for that lock. And then we add the necessary cuts in the pin stacks to ensure that our designated master key of 44217 also works in there. So here, the key pins would be, for example, for the first uh, first pin stack, which has a differ key of 3 and a master key of 4, we would use 3 plus 1, a key pin of height 3 plus a master wafer of height 1, which is openable by keys uh, with a cut of 3 or a cut of 4. And in second position, we just have 4 because it's openable just by 4 because both the master key and the differ key have a 4 in the second place. And then in the third place where the master key has a 2 and the differ key has a 7, then we put a 2 plus 5, which is openable by a 2 and a 7. In the next one we put a 1 plus 2, openable by a 1 and a 3. And then in the next we put a 7 plus a 1, which is openable by a 7 and an 8. And so this lock will be openable by both 3, 4, 7, 3, 8 and by 4, 4, 2, 1, 7. That's great. But note the unintended and somewhat surprising side effect that it will also be openable by 14 more keys because in each of the pin stacks you have two choices of valid cut depths uh, wherever there are two cuts and so this uh, since uh, four of the five pin stacks have two cuts instead of one cut then this gives us two to the four which is 16 different keys that would all open this lock uh, and one of them was our differ key and one of them was our master key, so there are 14 others that also open this lock. And so, in a sense, the introduction of master keying has reduced the security of the lock. In the sense that, in theory, there is fewer combinations of cuts to try before you will statistically hit one that actually opens the door. And not many customers of master key systems actually realize this. The introduction of master keying reduces the number of keys that won't work in that lock. But that's not the worst of it by far. 
Blaze's contribution was to point out a low complexity privilege escalation attack whereby the unprivileged user in cybersecurity terms who is entrusted with a different key that only opened her office could now reconstruct the master key which is the physical security equivalent of basically getting root on the system and she can do that with a pretty efficient search process. So Matt Blaze observed that for each pin stack if there is only one cut then that cut must be the same for the differ key and the master key. In our example, it was the second pin stack, which was cut at four in both the differ and the master key. Whereas if there are two cuts, then one is that of the differ key and the other one must be the one of the master key. Now his crucial insight was that the unprivileged user can probe for the second cut on each of the pin stacks separately. How? Well, firstly, she prepares one key blank for each of the S pin stacks. And she cuts that key blank for pin stack I to the same depth as her differ key in every pin position except position I. And she leaves it uncut in position I because that key is going to be used to find out what the master key is in position I. And so she files down that pin position gradually, okay, zero, one, two, three, four, all the way down to nine, she explores all possible cut depths from the shallowest to the deepest cut. And at every step, she checks whether the key opens the lock. So she knows she will definitely open the lock at at least one position, the position of her own differ key. And if this also opens the lock at some other depth, then that must be the depth of the cut of the master key in that position. And if no other cut depth, then the one of her own key opens the lock, then in that pin stack there is no master pin and no master wafer and the master key cut depth is therefore the same as that of her differ key. So with probes in just these s different uh, keys that she cut, then uh, she has discovered the cut positions in all pin stacks for the master key. The complexity of this ingenious physical privilege escalation attack is linear rather than exponential in the number of pin stacks. Now to wrap things up for the whole course, I want to answer the question of what security is. At least what is security to me as a professional, as a company owner in security and as an academic in the field. Treat this as another possible entry point into this course. I could have just as well started with the following foundational ideas in the very first lecture. So if I had to describe the discipline of security in a nutshell, I would tell you that security is basically risk management. You identify the assets of the system that needs protecting from undesirable events. You estimate the value of those assets to you, which gives you an upper bound on how much you should invest to protect them. And also the value of those assets to your adversaries, which contributes to your estimate of how motivated they are to go after those assets and therefore how likely it is that you will be suffering these attacks. You then identify the possible threats to your assets, which means the bad things that could happen to them. You identify the possible attacks, which is the ways in which adversaries might actualize those threats. You identify the vulnerabilities, which is the weaknesses in your system that makes the attacks possible, or at least easier to carry out. And then you consider the possible ways you might mitigate the possible attacks. And here some authors carefully distinguish between the safeguards, which are preventive things that you can do before disaster strikes, such as you know, installing a stronger front door to your house or taking backups or digital assets or uh, setting up a firewall, and countermeasures, which are a posteriori remedies that you can take after the fact, such as attempting to track down the thief or setting a bounty or retaliating even. I don't recommend retaliating, by the way, but anyway, things that you do after uh, the attack has been executed. Then, and this is the risk management core of security, you do your best to quantify all those values. You know, given how much the asset is worth to you, given how great your loss would be for each of the corresponding threats to it, given how likely each of the attack is on the basis of both its value to the perpetrator and the difficulty of carrying it out given the existing vulnerabilities and safeguards, given the cost of each of the safeguards and countermeasures to you, then you make an objective comparison and you assess whether paying for the certain and unrecoverable cost of the safeguards is better than incurring the loss on the assets. You see the picture. So this evaluation is never as precise as a mathematical formula based on this description might suggest, given that many of those values are in fact only polite guesses. 
but this risk management viewpoint, imperfect though it may be, is still vastly superior to the naive viewpoint of those who would like the security consultant to just make the system totally secure. The price for that would have to be infinite, because the system can never be secure against all possible threats. But it would be stupid to pay that price, or indeed any price that exceeds the value of the asset being protected. You'd be much better off allowing for the loss of the asset and then acquiring the asset again. Although, of course, you should note that this is not possible for all assets. Loss of life, for example, loss of confidentiality cannot be reversed. If you retain only one thing from this course, then let it be the above. Security is risk management, along with the viewpoint that you must protect an entire system, including its users, not just a computer or the files on it, and that you must therefore take a holistic view and understand the true protection goals before embarking in the nitty-gritty technical detail, on which you must be more proficient than the attackers if you want a chance to defeat them. As I said in another lecture, people cannot reasonably call themselves competent security experts if they only deal in hand-wavy generalities and organizational stuff but are not able to roll up their sleeves and write code to exploit an XSS vulnerability or a buffer overflow when it's in front of their nose, as you have now learned to do if you did all the practical exercises associated with this lecture course. But equally, people cannot call themselves competent security experts if they are incapable of seeing the big picture and protect the whole system and identify what needs to be protected and what is worth doing and what isn't, and how to put the right incentives in place. And while teaching and supervising security topics at Cambridge, even before developing this new course, I found that many of my stronger students fell into this second category. They were excellent at the nitty-gritty technical stuff, the questions that require writing code and coming up with an exact answer, but they were actually a bit weak about the bigger picture, the holistic system-level thinking, the seemingly more fluffy questions where the answer was an essay rather than a number or a piece of code. Uh, they, they wanted things that they could compare. Have I got this 100% right or not? Well, if you want to become a valuable expert, you need to overcome that fear and become good at that too. And the key to that is to view security as risk management. And I made another video a while ago where I attempt to demystify essay-style questions in security. And I think you might want to check it out. As I already told you, I'm the founder and the CEO of a small and discreet security company called Cambridge Cyber that serves a variety of government and industry clients. And the reason our clients are happy to pay our not insignificant fees and then call us again for repeat business is because we are not simply good at the hacking part. We go in, we listen, and we actually solve their security problems. And that requires both the holistic view and the competence about the technical details. And the best among your predecessors have greatly enjoyed doing occasional work for Cambridge Cyber, even before getting their degree. And I pay excellent rates to my collaborators. If you have a talent for the stuff within this course, then you could be next if you like. I know that a majority of you will specialize in some other branch of computer science and will not become security professionals. But I believe that all computer people would benefit from some fundamental practical security education. And it's on this basis that I developed this hands-on course. At the end of this course, you haven't become a security specialist. That's just impossible in just 12 lectures, but you have acquired some awareness. And if by today you have diligently completed all the seed lab exercises that I assigned, as was the case for those of you I personally supervised, then I guarantee you are now more competent about security than the average computer science professional. Rejoice. I hope some of you will have found this subject sufficiently inspiring that you will now want to do more. As you know, I co-founded the InterAce and with MIT the C2C or Cambridge to Cambridge University level capture the flag competitions. And I continue to serve on the steering committee of the reincarnated C2C CTF, now called Country to Country, which is currently in its third year, hosted by MIT, that some of you have even signed up for. Now we're very well done to those of you who took up this challenge. You will gain practical skills and you will make new friends. We mix up the people in the teams so that you partner with students of different skill levels and from other universities around the world. Now, one day, the best of you will become, I don't know, chief security officer at some major corporation or national security advisor to your country's government. And at that point, at the height of your career, when your homeland or your organization is under attack, then you'll be able to connect to the other very smart people you met in these CTFs and you'll be able to help each other out. Bad guys are organized, so we must be organized as well. These CTFs, this university course that I publish for everyone on YouTube, 
and my serving for the past 10 years as head of the Cambridge Academic Center of Excellence in Cybersecurity Research, all this is part of my small personal efforts as an educator in raising a new generation of cyber defenders. We need clever people like you to outsmart the bad guys and to defend the digital society we live in. Security is a fascinating quest because you must be extremely creative to anticipate and outsmart an intelligent adversary. If you have enjoyed the intellectual challenges I've thrown at you in these videos and you are willing to step up to the next level and make your own original contribution to this field, then think about going further and pursuing security in graduate studies at the master or the PhD level. The Cambridge Security Group is extremely strong and has an excellent research track record spanning several decades. I'm always on the lookout for outstanding students with whom to develop new exciting ideas. If you're interested in a master or PhD in security with us, these videos will help you think about it and both I and my colleagues will be happy to have an informal chat with candidates who take this prospect seriously. Get in touch. I put in many months of work into restructuring this lecture course into the present form. If you learn something from it, I will very much appreciate your saying so with the like button. This also nudges YouTube into suggesting the video to new people, which is the whole point of me putting these lectures out for everyone on earth rather than keeping them just to my Cambridge students. So thank you very much for helping out with that on this video and on all the others that you liked. This costs you no effort and it's much appreciated. On the other hand, if you're willing to help me even further and donate a few minutes of your time in exchange for the over a thousand hours of preparation, research, writing, filming and post-production that I put into these videos, then please fill in the survey at the URL in the description before the indicated deadline. The survey will close in a few days and it will help me improve the course for future years. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments and provided they are relevant to the course, I'll get back to you with a public answer as usual as I have done until now. Or write to me privately if you think that that's more appropriate. Thank you very much for watching. Best wishes for your exams, for your computer science career and possibly for your future PhD in security. And if you have subscribed to the channel, we meet again in the next video.